Hi friends, this is John Sewell from Elusive Productions, and today I will be presenting the fourth in our series of seven of uh, videos where we will be discussing our creative process in adapting the rights of Elusis into musical theater presentations. And my topic today is character development. Now, in order to talk about character development, first I want to analyze what Crowley had to say about the characters in the rights and then talk about kind of how we interpreted that and the direction that we went with it when we began doing our own adaptations. Everyone loves a good long quote, and I'm going to try and put this in here as a little text too so you can read it and follow along, but I want to show what Crowley meant when he was talking about the rights so you can sort of see our jumping off point in our interpretation. From The Rights of Eleusis, Their Origins and Meaning, Crowley wrote, The Truth Behind the Veil. It is, then, the primitive darkness of humanity that is represented in this ritual, referring to Saturn. Therefore, we have the despairing cry, there is no God, and as a logical result, the suicide of the high priest, for there cannot be a priest without a God. Pausing for a moment, you'll note that the priest is referenced in the rite of Saturn rather than the God itself, and this is going to be interesting in a moment when we start looking at our interpretation. It is the blackness of uttermost despair, and so the ritual ends. It is only in the second rite, the rite of Jupiter, who is etymologically and actually identical with the Hebrew Jehovah, that the light breaks. But even in that rite, when the supreme power is declared, it is too exalted for anyone to approach him. It is only by the work of the divine spirit that he is made manifest, and this manifestation only takes place in the God-man whom some call Iachus and others Jesus, again an etymological and mystical identity. This doctrine appears to me to differ from the orthodox doctrine of Christianity only in one point only. It is not sectarian. Now I'm going to stop there and we're going to unpack a little bit of that. So looking at Crowley's quote, we have in the rite of Saturn the suicide of the priest who is the stand-in for the divine, and the divine is missing. Whereas in the rite of Jupiter, we have the god form who is discussed and then takes on a human countenance in order to be related with. And then, of course, this god form continues into the rite of Mars and into the rite of Sol, the identity with Iachus and with the solar mysteries. We basically see, A, Crowley discussing the rites as priestly representations of the relationship with the divine, B, Crowley discussing the rites as interactions with the actual divine, and C, we see a character, in this case, uh, Kentrum and Torcono Kentry, who becomes Iachus slash Bacchus slash Dionysus, who becomes the hidden god slash soul in Ares in the rite of Mars, who becomes soul in the rite of soul as a singular identity. So the question then becomes, when we're watching the rites of Eleusis, are we seeing priests enacting uh, the divine story, or are we supposed to be seeing the story of the gods themselves? And in a sense, the answer to both is yes. We are seeing priests invoked of gods enacting the stories of gods, acting as that sort of meat suit that the gods are wearing. And that's where it gets interesting because both interpretations are valid and in fact going on simultaneously, or at least in our interpretation. I say in fact, but rather I should say experientially, I found both to be going on simultaneously. We also again have that indication in Crowley's own writing that the characters transition from one right to another rather than being independent within the rights themselves. Now, once we see that there is a connection between the various characters in the rites and how they sort of transition from one to the next, we then start to look at the variety of places where they take place. For example, is the Mother of Heaven in the rite of Saturn also the Sphinx in the rite of Jupiter, who is also uh, Scorpio 
in the right of Mars, Scorpio, Apophis in the right of Sol, and Venus in the right of Venus. Then Venus is slain, and the role transitions to Sora Gemini, the daughter, who then in the right of Mercury, who then becomes Luna in the right of uh, Luna. Now, if you look at that, you see that sort of interesting transition where the mother becomes the daughter, and then, of course, the daughter is elevated to the throne of the mother, something that Crowley discusses in the Book of Thoth when discussing the court cards and the path of return. So all of this ties together in our understanding and interpretation of these rites. These are all facets that we looked at when trying to develop the characterizations, talk about the motivations. Uh, there are also characterizations that we developed within the rites, and these are different because they are uh, outside of the source material, although, again, usually informed by the, um, by the symbolic meaning of the figures. And we can talk about that for a little bit. Now, one of my favorite developments that we, we came up with was Hebe and Ganymede both appearing in the rite of Jupiter. They were the two cupbearers of Jupiter. And in the uh, original mythology, they were not active at the same time. In fact, Ganymede was plucked from Earth to replace Hebe when Hebe was married off to Apollo. Uh, she was no longer pure enough to pass out the ambrosia. Uh, it was kind of a shit thing to do. And we chose to use that sort of displacement to create a story for Hebe and the right of Jupiter that speaks a lot about the role of women in more ancient cultures and the way that they were essentially treated as cattle. And then that beautifully ties in to the Dionysian revel. Once every two years, the women would basically go out into the woods, give the finger to the men, literally let their hair down because they weren't allowed to do that for the other remaining time and just rip animals apart and eat them with their bare hands like you do. So um, this gave a context then for the maenads and that's where this idea of using the piece of poetry and music that we wrote around the entire maenad section of the Rite of Jupiter to be an initiation for Hebe into this mystery and to sort of tell that in pantomime while the rite was going on. That is not something that Crowley had written into his version of the Rite of Jupiter, but rather it is something that we included to give a character context and movement within that rite. And this is something that we do throughout where you can see um, the way that we developed Capricornus in Mars. There's a whole PTSD thing going on when he's saying, my head is split, the, the crashing ax, uh, it's all about the, the pain of losing people you care about in this violent situation. Uh, so a lot of this is, is based on the idea that we wanted motivation to exist within these rites that wasn't necessarily written into them initially. And that's something that Crowley had talked about in his own writing as well, when he was basically saying he should have paid more attention to the characterization and development and the stagecraft and whatnot. Well, we're like, okay, well, if he said he should have done that, we'll just put that in there. And we did. Uh, we have our canon. The, you know, this is our canon. This is what we saw as being canon for us. It is not canon for the rites of Eleusis. There are so many ways to interpret this material, and ours is not the only way, and it shouldn't be the only way. I really feel strongly that people need to experience and embrace this material and do it themselves, because that's how you actually have this sort of relationship with it. When I'm talking about all this, you know, deep diving stuff that we did, we did it because we wanted to know and because this gave us an opportunity and a context in which to do that, where we were involved in a creative process, and that just kept feeding us going through the study and the joy of this. And I don't want to take that away from anyone. So please, if you have the opportunity, deep dive into this material and do that yourself. Now, when it comes to developing characters and characterizations, uh, there are some throwaway lines, some little things that happen in the rites that if you blink, you miss them. 
that when we're reading through and we're doing this exhaustive study and like, what does this mean? And how do we develop this? And, and who is this character? And, and, and what are they representing? That you'll see this line and you'll go, oh, let's deep dive on that for a second. What does that mean in the context of this rite? So one of those moments was in the rite of soul when you have uh, Brother Ares identify the location as the mountain of Abignas, which is the mountain of initiation. And if you were a member of the, say, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, you'd be like, oh, I know what place they're talking about. And if you were a member of, you know, the audience who had no context for that, you'd be like, oh, they're at some place with a hard to pronounce name. Well, the thing about that being at the mountain of initiation is that it then says what's about to transpire may be different underneath than what you're looking at. Is this a murder? Is this, is this a, a fratricide where one brother kills another? Or is it an initiation? And the answer is yes. Much as, is that the priest of soul, or is that soul incarnate, sitting atop the ziggurat? The answer is yes, because again, little column A, little column B, using both is what makes it an interesting juxtaposition. So when we presented the crucifixion of soul, we stylized his removal from the cross as a variation on the initiatory rituals that were being invoked by that one throwaway line, and it became a way to illustrate that there was a significance going on there that Crowley spoke about in the earlier part of the rite. It really drew the audience's attention to that and said, there's something deeper going on here. There's something further to look at. So let's look at that scene and sort of get the, the context for what we're talking about.
So I really like how that musical and, and interpretive scene came together in Seoul. And in a later edition of this talk, we will actually go into the musical themes that are associated with various characters that we then move through the, the rites so that basically you'll hear little snippets of music that identify one character with another character in the same rite or in a different rite. Uh, I will say in the broadest possible terms that one of the things that you'll notice about the rites and our composition is that when you're dealing with the Pillar of Mercy, the bulk of the music associated with the Pillar of Mercy is in major keys. And when you're dealing with the Pillar of Severity, the bulk of the music is in minor keys. And when you're dealing with the middle pillar, as in the case with Soul, you have this transition between major and minor keys really regularly. Lots of key changes going on both in Soul and in Luna. Uh, because we're huge nerds and we think about things like that. So uh, if you're listening and you have an ear for that sort of musical interpretation, time signatures matter, key changes matter, uh, major and minor keys matter. Certain themes go with certain characters. If you're enjoying the rites and you're listening for that, you're going to hear a lot. There's a rich sort of mixture of concepts in there that you may not have you know, picked up when you were just sitting and listening passively. But if you're actively listening, you're going to find a lot that we sort of interpolated into our understanding in the composition process. So enjoy that. Uh, if you enjoy geeking out on that sort of thing, geek out uh, and have a great time. Thank you for joining us for this little chat. Next time, we will be talking about what you can't see, things that we hid from the audience or that we basically had happen off stage or in poor lighting, uh, the limitations of, of our budget and whatnot, and how we use the imagination of the audience to fill in the blanks. Um, have a great one. Thanks.